We're looking at Kingdom Rush today, where you are working together with other players to defend the kingdom. This is a tower defense game based on the app, and your mission is to survive through campaigns of progressively harder scenarios. You're gonna face hordes of enemies emerging from portals, and you're gonna have to defend against their attacks by utilizing your hero, strategically placing your towers, and upgrading those towers to destroy enemies before they reach the kingdom. Hi, and welcome back to the channel. I am stoked to have you here learning another tutorial with me today. We are looking at Kingdom Rush. Right before we get started, I just wanna mention, if you like what I'm doing here, if you like this channel, if you like the shirts, that I just came up with. They are all linked down below. If you wanna pick one up and you wanna share it across social media, tag me across social media so I can share them as well. And with that, let's get started learning this co-op. Is this the first co-op of the channel? I think it is. I think it is the very first co-op that we're learning. So let's get started. Now, since this is a scenario-based game, setup is gonna be a little bit different. I'm gonna show you kind of like the general setup first and then we'll set up for the fourth scenario, which is called with might and magic. And this is going to be for a two player game with all of the fancy 3D towers and all the all the fancy stuff from the Dragon Pledge because, well, it's more interesting to look at. How about that? Now, first off, you wanna separate each set of towers like how I am showing you here, along with their corresponding resources. Now this tray, in case you're wondering, it does come with the King Pledge. Then take a set of color transparent building site cards or the 3D towers along with the same colored player marker. And again, a two player setup today. So I'm gonna take green and purple only since that is what scenario four requires. Now everyone is going to pick up a hero mini, their corresponding hero board, their hero card and damage tiles for that specific hero. Then you're gonna take one of these heart tokens and put it on your hero board in the maximum health spot to the right and also grab one of these helper cards as well. And lastly, take the towers according to your player board and player count. I'm taking one archer, one bomber, and one mage for Magnus and plus my hero. So this is my complete starting hand. So what's different about this game is that setup is gonna be a little bit different depending on the difficulty that you choose. One, two, three stars, heroic and iron are the five difficulty levels. We'll set up for three stars since that is what the game recommends. So you're gonna take four of these heart tokens and put them near the exit since that is what is required for three stars. And the reason why we are setting up for with might and magic is because it's the first one that has an example of pretty much everything. So in case you don't wanna be spoiled by this campaign, just a heads up, that we are skipping a few levels ahead so you can see full detail of everything. That way you'll know exactly what you're gonna be getting into. For this map, super easy. You'll put three tiles side by side. You have A3 and A4 that you put side by side and then a small one by one G3 tile on the top left corner. All of the transparent tiles or the 3D towers <laughs> or both as you can see here, I'm putting the 3D towers on top of the transparent tiles. These go on top of their designated tiles that is shown on your specific scenario or campaign map. Next, you have these orange tokens with a skull in them. These are called spawn tokens, which will go here. Next to the spawn token, you'll make the spawn stack. You organize these cards according to what's shown in the scenario book and make sure that the cards are face down. Here we have two tabs here. These are called exit tiles and they go at the end of the pass for each scenario. You'll also take five crystals and for this scenario, it's calling for spells with one power icon. So since you have four spell tiles, choose three out of those four available. You can tell their spells because it has a blue power symbol in the top left corner. You also will take two special ability tiles that match your hero. You know that they are hero spell cards because they have the yellow Warglaive icons. Side note, for all of your resources that we just talked about, just make sure that you adjust it accordingly to your player count and your scenario by referring to your specific map page in whatever scenario that you decide to play. Like for this scenario, it calls for five crystals for two players. And if you're playing solo, it'd be nine crystals and so on. And that's the setup, nice and quick. So the overarching goal of most of these scenarios will be to destroy all monster portals and survive until the end of that round. Based on which scenario that you're playing though, sometimes you'll have to escort different people. Sometimes you'll have to defeat bosses, specific enemies. The scenario should tell you exactly what your winning condition is. In the scenario that we are playing, scenario four, we gotta destroy all the portals and then the final round gets triggered right after in which we must survive in order to win that campaign. Leading us to my favorite question of all time for every single tutorial, how do we play this game? So how do we play Kingdom Rush? There are six phases in this game and we're gonna go over them one by one, but we are gonna skip over phase one since it doesn't happen in the very first part of the game or the very first round of the game. 
We're gonna start at phase two, which is to play tower and hero cards. In phase two, as long as you have the cards to do so, you can take however many actions you want, and you can also take them in any order you want. But just make sure that all the steps of one action is completely done before moving on to the next. So how do we play tower cards? Easy. You take one tower from your starting hand and put it on a building site that matches your color. So purple in this case, and you can also orient it in any way you'd like. Pay attention to the arrows because they point to the tile that it's gonna hit. And if you see this double arrow, that means it's going to hit one consecutive space from that straight line, just like this. If you see a green symbol, then that tower can target any space on the map. A couple more symbols that you should know as well, the sword icon are physical attacks and will have red arrows. Magical attacks are the blue flames and will have blue arrows. Purple flames means true damage, so they cover enemies with both physical and magical defense types, and they also have purple arrows. Now on the other hand, if you see a black strike through symbol, it means that they block that type of damage. So a black strike through sword means that they are immune to all physical attacks. This is immune to all magic, and this symbol means that they can only be covered by damage tiles, not by heroes or soldiers. Okay, so you take a card from your hand and place it on a tower, and now that's going to spit out an attack. The type and shape of attack is listed on the card, and you can't change the orientation unless it has this symbol like it does on Big Bertha. Now the damage tiles that spit out from a tower, we got some rules for those. Damage tiles, soldiers, or heroes have to be placed within borders of a single horde tray, which are these brown trays with cards on top. Oh, but wait, what if an enemy has this icon on there? You already know the answer. Then that means that they are immune to a specific type of damage. So you can't put a damage tile on that enemy if they are immune to it. So I can't put these archer arrows on the stronger warrior since that warrior is immune to physical damage. And one more important thing to note, if an attack has multiple range arrows and multiple damage tiles, then each damage tile can be placed on the same or different hordes as long as all target hordes are within range. The one exception to this is if the tower shows damage tiles with the plus symbol that's linking them. That means that they have to be placed on a single horde tray within attack range. So those cover the three towers that have damage tiles, which are archers, mages, and bombards. The soldier towers are slightly different. The militia tower generates soldier meeples that can be put anywhere on the horde tray, and they cover a single square. Again, no overlapping, so you can't put a soldier meeple on a damage tile, another soldier, of course, or a hero. If there's no legal place to put a soldier, then you will lose those soldier meeples. Some more important things to know about soldiers. They have a health pool of one. They prevent horde trays from advancing, and the soldier pool is also limited. So once you are out of soldier meeples, then that's it. And they also allow you to place an extra tower on a building site, meaning you can put another tower on top of a militia or vice versa. So you can have two towers on top of each other as long as one of them is the soldier tower and you are the building site owner. Okay, so to play a tower card, we take one from our hand and we put it on one of our colored transparent squares or 3D towers. We orient it in any direction that we'd like with the arrows pointing to the spot that the tower is going to spit out those attacks. Then we put damage tiles or soldiers on the horde trays, making sure that we take into account the defense icons and if there are any plus symbols that restricts damage tiles to them being put on a single horde tray. One other type of card that these towers can attack is a purple portal card. In the center of a portal card, you will see a number. That number tells you the minimum level that a tower has to be in order to put damage tiles or soldiers on that particular portal card. Just make sure that you are not covering up the middle number. The crazy thing is, once you attack a portal card with a tower, then that tower will get destroyed and turned upside down. Now your tower card doesn't have to attack a portal card if there are other available targets. If that portal card is the only valid target, then you have to use all the attacks on that portal card, AKA you cannot choose to not attack. The one exception to this is if all enemies on a portal card are already covered and then the damage tile doesn't have to be placed on the empty square. So you still save your tower from being destroyed. Heroes can never end their turn on a portal card. They can't attack a portal card, but they can move through it. And lastly, if a portal card ever reaches the exit, you will automatically lose. Okay, so what we've gone over so far sounds like a lot of information, but in reality, it's just showing you how to play a tower card and the little nuances that go with that major action.
If you don't want to build a tower this round, you can pass your tower to another player. But once you pass your tower card to another player, you have to upgrade it one level and that upgraded card gets put face down in the other player's hero board where it says incoming towers. Your initial tower then goes back to the supply, so the lower level one. But let's say you want to upgrade a tower and there aren't any upgrades left in the supply. Then that means you cannot upgrade that tower. So you put the tower that you wanted to upgrade from your hand into the next player's hero board. Okay, so we have play a tower, pass the tower in order to upgrade it. The third one is to play your hero card. To do that, you just take your hero card and put it on your hero board slot. Then you move your mini one space for each movement point that they have, which you can tell from the flying shoe icon at the very bottom of the hero board. In this case, magnets can move three spaces. Your first move always has to be on the space next to the exit. And then they can move in any direction and through building sites, on the path, through spaces occupied by hordes, and of course, empty spaces as well. They just can't move off the map or end their movement on a tower or a portal. You also want to orient your heroes just like you did with the towers once they are at their final spot because that is the direction that they'll be attacking. If you end your hero on a horde tray, then your hero will engage it, meaning it covers a 2x2 two two space and they do true damage. So they can be placed on top of enemies that are both magical and physical resistant, but not deadly enemies. Now once your heroes finish moving, now they can do one out of three actions. For a basic attack, you place your hero specific damage tiles in the same exact way as the towers. So if your hero does a basic attack, there are two different ones. You have your melee attacks. Naturally, it can only be done on the horde tray that your hero is engaged on. If they use a ranged attack, they work exactly like towers and they of course have to be further away so ranged can't be used on the same horde tray that your hero's on. Now the strong attacks are called special abilities. If you use a special ability, it gets put face down and will be flipped back up once you use recover. Each hero also has two other abilities. Instant abilities are listed in the basic attack panel and these will usually deal damage to enemies. They also have ongoing abilities and these are listed on the bottom right and these are active until the end of the round and can also take effect during any one of the phases that's explained on the tile. One special type of ongoing ability are protection abilities that make your hero immune to all damage types until the end of the round. So basic attack, special ability, and lastly is recover, where you move your heart token back to your max health and flip all special abilities used face up. If your hero ever gets damaged, you move your heart token to the left. And if it reaches the skull icon, then your hero mini is removed from play and put on your hero board and put on their side as well, which means that they have to regenerate at the start of the next round. Okay, so when you use your hero, you get to perform a basic attack that's either melee or ranged. Or option number two, they can also use a special ability. Just make sure that you flip over that special ability tile or option number three, and that is to recover, where your heroes will regenerate maximum health and all special ability tiles are flipped face up again, ready for use. And that's phase two. You can all play simultaneously or take turns and you can also perform the actions in any order you want. Again, you can play tower cards from your hand to match your color spot on the table. You can pass your tower to another player to upgrade it. And you can also play your hero card moving your hero and performing one action, either a basic attack, use a special ability or recover. Then we move on to phase three, which is to destroy horde trays. Okay, so where are we? All of our attacks are now on the horde trays. So any horde tray that's fully covered is removed from play. Then you return all tiles and soldiers to the supply. For each crystal icon on the back of the horde tray, you put that crystal near the exit. If your hero was standing on the tray when it was destroyed, then your hero takes one damage but still stays on that space where the horde tray was removed. If that tray was a portal, check to see if it was the last one. And if it is, that triggers end game. So this will be the final round of the game. But if trays are not destroyed, then they are going to keep moving, leading us to phase four, moving those horde trays. So you first wanna to check to see if a couple symbols are visible. First, if you see the heal icon, you remove all damage tiles from that horde before it moves. The speed icon with the double green arrows allows the horde tray to move twice down the pathway. And if you have any visible dead eye symbols, the one that looks like a target, that deals one damage to each hero on an adjacent space to the horde tray's new position on the path. Second, check if there are any soldiers or heroes on the tray. If there are, then each soldier and hero takes one damage and the tray does not move. FYI, if soldiers take any damage, then they are returned to the supply. Now, if they have a speed icon though, soldiers will only block the first movement, so the tray is gonna move again. 
but heroes can stop the tray from moving twice, they just take two damage instead. And that's also if they have enough health to do so as well. And from there, you literally just move the trays down the path, starting with the tray nearest the exit, followed by the next nearest and so on. Okay, so now you might be thinking, what if a horde tray is stuck and it can't move because the next space is occupied by another horde tray. In that case, the tray actually jumps over the tray and moves on to the next available path that's towards the exit. And some scenarios will have forked paths. In that case, you're going to move hordes from the section of the path with the lowest number spawn token first. If a horde tray reaches the exit, you count the number of enemies that are not covered on the tray and you get one heart token removed from the kingdom supply near the exit pile. That's the pile that we set in the beginning according to the difficulty level. If you are out of hearts, then the kingdom is overrun and you lose. If not, then those escaped horde cards will get discarded. Okay, so the next couple of phases are really quick. So we'll go over them and then do a full summary of what you're doing on your turn. Phase five is after we've moved all the horde trays. Now we pick up all the tower cards we built on building sites, all upgraded towers passed on to other players that were in front of your tray, and your hero card. In case you're wondering, there is no hand limit. Any of your destroyed and flipped down towers are also returned to the supply. And the last phase of the game is phase six, where you all decide what tower cards to purchase with your crystals, which is a group currency. Level one towers cost two crystals, level two towers cost three crystals, and the rest you have to upgrade and you can't buy them. Again, victory is achieved depending on which specific scenario that you're playing, but if it's not listed, then it is to destroy all three portals and survive till the end of that round. Now we go back to phase one where we spawn new hordes. So you flip the top card of each spawn stack face up, starting with the spawn stack that has the lowest spawn token number. After that, you put each horde card into an empty horde tray and put it on the pass space. Every horde card has a purple line along one edge. This is important because it tells you how to orient the horde card. So make sure that it is parallel to the nearest exit. If a hero happens to be on that space, then the hero will get moved to an adjacent empty space or building site. If there is none, then they will go to your player board and the horde gets put in that spot instead. And recap time. So phase one, the one that we just went over, you spawn in new hordes by flipping horde cards face up and putting them in empty trays, starting with the lowest spawn token number. Remember that you are skipping phase one in the very first turn of your game. Phase two, which is technically the first phase that you start out with if you're playing the game fresh. Here, you play tower cards from your hand into colored slots and orient the arrows in any way you like. You can also pass tower cards to other players so you can upgrade them the next turn. And you can also play your hero card letting you move your hero mini from your board to the tile nearest the exit first. After that, they can move in any direction and through anything. They just can't end their movement on the tower card. Also, don't forget that you also get to perform one action for your hero, a basic attack, a special ability, or recover all health and your used special abilities. After you play your tower and hero cards, damage output from the towers and heroes goes onto the horde trays. And that leads us to phase three. So any fully covered horde tray is removed and you also gain crystals that's listed on the back of those cards. Heroes will also get damaged if they were standing on a horde tray. Now, if you destroyed the last portal card, that triggers end game, where you have to survive until the end of the round to win. But more often than not, horde trays won't be destroyed. So now you move the ones that are still alive and heal them if you see the healer visible, move them twice if you see the green double arrows and damage your heroes if you see the dead eye icon. So damage is done, horde trays have been moved. Pick up all your towers. You pick up the upgraded towers that were passed to you and you also pick up your hero card. Remember that there is no hand limit in this game. If towers were face down though, then that means that they are destroyed and go back to the supply. Then you collectively decide what towers to buy. Level one towers are two crystals, level two towers are three crystals and level three and four towers you can't buy. So you have to upgrade by passing cards for those towers. And that's it. So then you would start over by spawning new hordes from phase one. You also wanna check what your video condition is for your specific scenario. But most of the time it is to destroy three portals and survive till the end of that round. Remember that you will lose if your heart tokens are gone or if a portal card or a boss enters the kingdom. And that is Kingdom Rush. Thank you all so much for joining me on yet another tutorial. If you have any thoughts about this game, comment down below what you think about Kingdom Rush. Have a fantastic board game night, day, afternoon, and I'll see you all in the next video.